Ooh, the drop bar 29er mountain bike, stroke monster cross bike, stroke gravel bike. The bike you need for the rides you actually want to do. Hello, and welcome to my world of cycling. I'm David, and this is the ramblings of a quite frankly below average and overweight mid 50s guy who's ended up doing things a bit differently and quite likes it that way, to be honest. Now, having cycled a bit and come to the honest conclusion that I'm not a super strong or super motivated speed performance rider. I decided to build a bike that really suited the kind of riding that I want to do. Being a bit older, I found that a road race bike can be a bit uncomfortable. I think I've lived with it for a long time and basically just kind of got used to it. Now I trade bikes quite a lot. I get bored pretty quickly and the ones that linger have been personalised for my tastes and abilities. Bikes don't really have to be hard work. They don't have to be uncomfortable either. Do they have to be ultimately fast though? Well, how much time do you spend on it? And what proportion of that time are you racing? Be honest, not really. You're never really at 100% unless you race or your ego won't let another commuter go past faster. I'm really cool there with the relaxed ride vibe. Sure, there are days when I found I've done some fast sections, but they've just happened because it felt right. If I'm being honest, the reality is I just really like getting out and about. A lot of people just want something they enjoy, suits their kind of riding and will get them out on the bad days as well as the good days. And honestly, if it's not comfortable and you don't have the right clothing, it's going to give you more reasons to stay in than go out, which is bad. Anyway, this build that I've done starts with a giant talon that I bought. The Talons are an entry-level mountain bike. They use design geometry from iterations of Giants race-winning cross-country bikes from previous. This particular one was so well used, but it came with lots of kit that was new, having just recently upgraded it all. In short, the fork, wheels, derailleurs, chain rings, cassettes, brakes were all XT standard and in really good condition. But the frame was in really neglected hobo condition. Essentially what I did was keep the wheels. I sold most of the other parts that I didn't use to recoup my expenditure. The frame was in such a sorry state I was actually going to bid it. So it went into the garage waiting that final day. Now fast forward a year to the pandemic and lockdown hit big time. Getting out except for exercise wasn't happening and oh boy a fresh mental stimulus was really required. Getting out on the mountain bike was great, but I was riding to trails on road, which I like to do. But let's face it, proper off-road tyres can be hard work on miles of tarmac. Also, I couldn't take the bike, the road bike down proper trails, as it's usually a disappointment of financial or medical proportions if you give it a full send. I think you can see where I was going here. The frame came out for a look, and to be honest it was really depressing to look at but I had time on my hands and a project to throw myself at. The kind of rides I was doing didn't require a suspension fork, but I also didn't want to exclude the use of one either. The terrain would be varied after all. Woods, fire roads, paths, single track, potholed road, and smooth tarmac. Gravel bikes are capable, but I wanted a mountain bike frame and wheels, as the bike may well leave the ground during rides, so a rigid mountain bike fork was bought. The other thing I didn't want was settling for smaller wheels to have clearance for bigger tyres. Oh no, 29ers with big tyres like my mountain bike, I've tried 27.5 and couldn't tell the difference from 26. 29ers, you have no problem telling the difference, they roll so well. So where to start then? Well, the frame had been so well used it was hard to find places which had paintwork but didn't have marks. Lots of marks from stone chips, rubs, nicks, chain rub. You can also see the paint had been worn away from transport use and being thrown in the back of a builder's van. Also, other issues like the bottle cage riv nuts were quite bad. One was stripped and the other had very visible thread wear. These are quite easy to place if you're going to paint the frame. A Dremel or drill can damage paint as you try to remove these, so before prep was the ideal time to do these. These were drilled and replaced. 
scratches and small nicks and dents were filled with epoxy and flatted down. Then I started to prep the frame for primer. Right, now we're at the degreasing and cleaning part. Basically, after the riv nuts have been done, it's a good clean up for the frame. Um, it needs to be completely degreased. There should be no uh, traces of dirt, oil, grease, anything on it. So all the areas around the headset, uh, bottom bracket, chain area, rear axle where the cassette is, they all need to be really, really clean. Basically, any dirt grip, anything that's built up into there needs to be removed. Um, once this is done, basically, and you've rubbed it down, you've got all the smoothness and imperfections out that you need to, um, the first primer coat was added. Um, I use a high build primer, basically, as I don't want any imperfections, and it fills in small imperfections and scratches when you rub it down, you lose those. Once this was done, a quick check reveals some very slight imperfections were still visible. And honestly, I needed to see the frame in a single colour to make these visible to me. I don't pick them up very easily. Remedial work sorted these out and it was full speed ahead to get another primer coat on, as you can see. Now, once I was happy with the primer and the state of the frame at this stage, um, the first thing to do was a base coat of silver metallic. Um, I wanted a very sparkly one, or the sparkliest one that I could get basically, so I used the base coat that they used to mix all the other silvers with. Um, essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a silver base coat on, then I'm going to use a candy top coat basically, so the silver will shine through the sort of translucent lacquer. Um, I've got a, I did have a think actually at the time that I've got a spray gun that I can spray metal flake with, which is even bigger. It's almost like glitter basically under the paint. But for some reason, I don't know why, I managed to talk myself out of this. In hindsight, I wish I'd given it a go because um, I have done it before and it has looked very, very good. But anyway, I digress. Um, two coats later, we had a nice shiny silver frame. I was feeling pretty pleased with myself and it was looking good. I wanted to add some detail to the head tube, bottom bracket and seat tube area. So a gold metallic base coat was shot onto those areas. Um, I don't have a spray booth and I don't do this professionally. So basically it's all done in the back garden near the garage. And you have to be really careful with wind, dust, bugs, etc. Anything that can ruin paint when it's sticky will land on it. So you've got to be really careful. Don't do it on a windy day. Ah. And there comes the creative bit. I did want a custom paint job. I didn't want to spend too much time on it. I just wanted to get it done. I've used stencils before, so I went reading through the garage to find the box which I had my stencils in. Whilst looking through them, I actually did find some lace material. Now, I've used an aerosol and lace before, um, which works quite well but I hadn't used it on a bike frame or a car or, or anything else so this was fairly new to me. Anyway, grabbed the material and to locate the material on the frame I used clothes pegs so you can pull it nice and tight and basically spray through it. Once it was placed on a few places I used the satin black and blew over the gold areas with the satin black and it looked quite nice actually, I was quite pleased with it. Um, once that was done, the idea was I was going to spray a candy, which I hadn't picked out the colour of. I've got orange, red, blue, green and purple. I hadn't picked the colour out, but I thought I'll use the, the purple because I haven't used that before. A bit like the green and the orange, to be honest. I haven't used those either. Um, all of them would have looked really good, but I went for the purple. Uh, I don't know why, but I'm quite glad I did in the end. So the final part now, the final top coat in candy purple. That was the colour that I picked and that was what was going to be sprayed. It was all mixed up in the uh, mixing jar, getting ready to go into the paint gun and off I went. Um, a couple of passes later over the course of the day, leaving it with about 50 minutes to dry in between before the next coat went on. And it was done and I was left, left out in the sun essentially to dry and harden and I had no intention of touching it until a day or so later. Um, but I was spending rather a lot of time admiring it after it was done, I must say. And here's some pictures of it. Take a look, let me know what you Right, there becomes rebuild time. 
Um, it's a case of putting all the fittings back on the bike, new rear mech hanger, bottle cage rib nuts are put in, uh, bottom bracket, headset, and it was build time. It's a bit unfashionable, but I've tried one by setups, two by setups, and eventually settled on a triple. Some of the hills here are up 20-25%, and despite many years of riding, I still don't consider myself a strong rider. The XTR triple crank set that was fitted has got 42, 32, 22 teeth. For excellent cadence regulation, the rear cassette is an 1136. It will literally climb anything. And on dales that I don't feel that strong, it will still climb anything. So I no longer hill dodge anymore. I might not get up the hill fast, but I do get up them. I also wanted larger tyres for comfort, speed and, well, basically good grip. I do have a good variety of off-road tyres and some of the off-road tyres can be heavy going, um, especially on roads. Um, if you like the Maxxis Minion type treads, um, they are the absolute worst to ride on roads basically. So when it's been wet I have some racing Ralphs and for the dry and hard pack basically Schwalbe G1 speeds. Um, the sizes are 29 by 2.35 so they're literally 60 millimeters. Um, they are very, very fast, and the clearance at the back and the front of the frame will probably accommodate 2.5s um, if they do a size that size that's slicked anyway. Um, tires are obviously run tubeless. I've got the hang of doing them now. It wasn't easy to start with, and it was pretty messy, but now I, I run them all that way. Um, tire pressures literally can run down to 20 psi or slightly below for off-road on this. Um, a pump is carried on the bottle cage. Um, on some of those rides, I let the pressure out. Basically, if it's going to be off-road quite a bit, and I can blow them up if I need to, basically, for tarmac. But to be perfectly honest, they're not that slow, even at very low pressures. Um, the same grip makes the bike an excellent descender on tarmac. It grips far better than any road bike I have ever ridden, and the tyre footprint is absolutely huge, um, hence the grip and traction. Um, wheel sizes are bigger and heavier than your standard 700 by 28 but if you're not making constant accelerations and climbs you really don't notice it to be honest. Um, shifting is handled by 105 STI, is the 10 speed, 10 by 3. Um, the mech is a long cage and they do a really good job. It can accommodate a 36 cassette. Um, I've got one of those wolf tooth thingies that fits below the rear hanger just in case I need to go in bigger. Uh, but it works fine like that. Um, you can hear the rear mech slap chain stays on particularly bad um, off-road descents, but it's not really that much of a worry. I've had mountain bikes years ago that didn't have clutches on them, so it's not that. Now, the braking is handled by disc brakes. I didn't have a full hydraulic shifter caliper combination, but it does have some TRP HYRD remote calipers called high roads. I don't know what they're called, to be honest. Um, Essentially, it's a master cylinder and caliper are combined, and it's pulled by a brake cable. Didn't know how they would feel, and I did earmark the next set of spare Altegra hydraulic sets that I'd have I'd put on. But since they've been on, I really haven't given it much thought to how bad they are. They're actually very, very good, to be honest. Um, TRPs are coupled with a 180 front rotor and a 160 rear rotor. Um, these are the rotors I use on my mountain bikes, so I can swap the wheels over very, very easily. Uh, the bike and I are heavier than they could be. No, really, we could both do with losing a bit of mass. But these larger rotors tend to deal with long downhill stops a lot better than 140mm road discs, so they're not coming off. Um, you don't get heat distortion either compared to my Giant Defier, which has got the 140mm rotors. Um, road bikes can't go too mad with load rotors. Obviously, they don't have the tyre footprint, basically, so it kind of makes sense to run them with the smaller discs. And I've never had that much of a problem with the with the road side of it anyway. Um, you just cope with what you've got. But any set of discs are a lot better than um, caliper brakes anyway. <laughs> um, And then we come to the handlebars. I started with a set of 42 centimeter bars, giant connect road bars. Um, they're great on road, and I've had many bikes with these equivalent, but when you go off road, the levers don't sit well for the best control. Literally, your hands are in a vertical position, which doesn't make for great uh, control, basically. So I bought some uh, Ritchie 
uh, Adventure Max uh, handlebars. They're really quite wide, and but also they've got a flare on the bar, so your hands are sitting probably at about 30 degrees as opposed to 90 degrees vertically. Um, so it's a little bit, it's not quite like a flat bar, but it's a lot better than the standard vertical drops, basically, that you've got. Um, so they work really, really well. I think the width is around about 55 or 57 centimetres on these, so they're very, very wide bars. But they are super com comfortable, and I would seriously consider putting them on a road bike next time as well, because the control is so much better. They've got quite shallow drops as well, so riding in the drops is quite easy on these, and it's not uncomfortable. Um, I also wanted to be able to get out in all weather, so mud guards were going to be a must for me. Um, I've got these weatherproof trousers and things that I wear as well, so if it's raining, it doesn't really worry me. I tend to stay fairly dry, but I must say, the mud guards, what a revelation. Um, these are very, very unusual SKS uh, blue moles, they're called, and the width of them is 75mm, so they actually cover a 60mm tyre quite well. But literally, when you start hitting puddles or when it's rain, you don't get that streak up your back. You don't get the wetness and the cold that goes with it. They just work really, really well. Um, unbelievable. Um, it's my bike that I take out in rough weather, so it works really great. So that's the build, quite literally, for this bike. And it's a bike that I've been on quite a lot, and actually more or less exclusively since July last year when it was first built up. It's gone through quite a few iterations, trying different wheels, trying different cranks, trying different brakes, trying different saddles, and quite a few bits to be honest with you. But getting out on it is a, an absolute pleasure. Um, so if you want to know anything more about it, um, just let me know in the comments. If not, basically I'll probably be doing a a video on the gearing of bikes because I think that's an important one and a lot of people just go for fashion rather by than what suits them um, which is quite important if you're going to go out riding you want something that suits you and not the bike shop that's selling it to you anyway thanks for watching in um, I hope it's been a benefit or amusement whatever entertainment or whatever but uh, thanks a lot for that goodbye